Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Welcome to this week's episode of People First. My guest this week is Kimberly Reed, who is an award an award winning international speaker, author, corporate trainer, and diversity equi- equality and inclusion executive. She's been nationally recognized as a thought leader, expert, strategist, and advisor to some of the world's most influential organizations in global professional services, healthcare, financial services, consumer products, and pharmaceutical industries. She's a seasoned leader in transforming organizations into high-performing enterprises and successfully turning around troubled diversity practices by designing, building, leading, and shaping high-performing cultures. Her book, Optimists Always Win, is going to be the focus for today's conversation. It's available from all good book retailers, and all proceeds are being donated to two cancer charities. So, Kimberly, welcome to People First. Well, hello, Mark. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing great for this Monday morning. I can't wait for our conversation. I know it's going to be high energized and fun. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Well, I open every episode because this is a leadership um, journey. Uh-huh. And so I want to start with your origin story, Kimberly. So way back when, well, not that far way back when, but when you were at elementary school and the teacher was, Kimberly, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was your answer back then? <laughs> well, I, okay. So more, I had three answers. Okay. okay. So I got to walk you through it. Okay. okay so it. Very briefly. I wanted to first, I said a, a pediatrician, right? Because it sounds wonderful, right? When your parents tell people, my daughter or my child wants to be a doctor when they grow up, right? Mm-hmm. And that was very much a reality for me, right? Because, you know, I, I have wonderful, wonderful parents. My mom passed away um, nine years ago. But growing up, I always wanted to be her. And so, although she was not a doctor, she was a people person. She loved Mm -hmm. people. So I kind of thought about it as I grew up just a little throughout the, throughout my childhood years that I then wanted to be Oprah. So I, when I saw her on the fur on her first show, Uh fabulous scarf with my mom wore a fabulous scarf as well. I decided to do my book report in the seventh grade on her. I even had a conversation with her best friend, Gail, because I am from Connecticut and Gail King lived in Glastonbury and she was on the 11 o'clock news. Oh my goodness. Yes. Seven. She did an interview. Wow. So I was, so, uh, so this was seventh grade. So I called, I called the, the station. I don't know how, I don't remember now how we got her number, but she, nevertheless, she called me back. My dad answered the phone. I'll never forget this. My mom was at, my mom was at work and he said, Kim Gail King is on the phone. And I said, and he said, yeah. So I got on the phone, seventh grade. And I said, hi, Miss King. I am doing a book report on Oprah Winfrey. And I was hoping that I could talk with you about a few things about Oprah. She said, absolutely. And lo and behold, I got an A plus on my book report. And I've always wanted to thank Oprah. So if she is ever listening to us, thank you Oprah, for my first A plus. And I wanted to be you. I still do because I love people. I love her giving. I love her spirit. I love her brilliance. And so that's who I wanted to be. So hopefully I'm a little, I, I'm one step closer by sharing, uh, sharing interviews like this and writing a book, Optimists Always Win, and in my work in diversity, equality, and inclusion that helps, I hope, that our contributions make this world a better place. I really do. Well, I love that. I love that story and connection. And you are like Oprah because you're going to give the proceeds. I give to you the proceeds from the book. And my life's been touched by cancer, too, with my mum passing away 21 years ago now um, from a brain tumour. So tell me about your inspiration for the book, Optimists Always Win. Well, Morg, I, I under, I, you and I are kindred spirits in that regard. Um, losing a mother uh, mm-hmm. is you know, um, It is the toughest thing that I've ever faced. My mom died nine years ago. And she is, when I say a phenomenal, extraordinary 
every synonymous with each of those words, she was. Barbara E. Reed. She was my heir. We were best friends. She, mm -hmm. her and my God, I, I thank God every day that God decided to give those parents, my mom and dad, to me. Because my mom and dad believed in me. They always pushed me to do better. They always wanted me to have the best, be the best. And they told me I could be the best. And so my mom, from a wo extraordinary woman perspective, she was, she embodied elegance, embodied giving, embodied just such a divine spirit. And she was the inspiration for the book because when I watched her for 45 days uh, in the hospital, and we didn't know that they would be her last days, mm -hmm. but every morning, more when I went into her room, hospital room, my dad and I had shifts. So I went in the morning early so I can talk with the doctor and be the liaison between the doctor and her because I just wanted, my dad and I just wanted her to focus on being better or being yeah. better. So she would have her hand on the Bible or she would be reading the Bible, sitting next to her window. And she said, good morning, honey. <laughs> she did that every morning for 45 days, even when I know she didn't feel well. The doctors even said, Kim, it's hard for us to diagnose your mom or to get an idea how she's feeling because she either says, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. or she says, honey, I'm just fine, fine, fine. And that's a song by Mary J. Blige. <laughs> <laughs> so she's song. my song when I do my, when I am doing my keynote addresses, I come into that song. And it always brings me wonderful blessings and, and helps us uh, connect with the audiences. It's just wonderful. So I, that's a very long answer. But Morg, I had to say that because I that will that will be the barometer for our, the remainder of our conversation, because I learned so much from her, not just the inspiration to go through, because who knew several months, a few months later, I would have my own bout with <laughs> Yeah, oh, yes. I remember reading that in the introduction in terms of it. And it blights so many people or it impacts so many people and with varying outcomes. And what I took away from your book, again, is it's not just optimism for optimism's sake, but it is reminding me of the quote. There was that fabulous lady who was auditioning for, I think it was America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comment was made, oh, my goodness, you're so glass half full, so enthusiastic, despite yeah. all the challenges in her life. And her comment was, well, you can't wait until the bad times have passed in order to be happy. That's you right. have to make the most of now in spite of the challenges or the whatever may be knocking us back, yes. which then brings us back to the book is how do you, how do you look for the good when it can feel like it's a perpetual stormy day? Well, I will tell you more that I hit rock bottom when my mother mm -hmm. happened. And I thank God that I didn't turn to alcohol and drugs because sometimes rock bottom means that for many people. Rock bottom may mean a deep depression that they that people never come out of. Rock bottom is definition is different for everyone's journey. But for me, rock bottom was the sun going down in my soul. And what I love about the quote, what I love about what you just described is so true. If it wasn't, my oncologist said to me, if it wasn't for my attitude, my outcome would be different mm -hmm. as far as living. When I went hit rock bottom, I didn't know what joy was anymore. I didn't know because the sun went down and when it sun down, sun goes down in your spirit, the lights are off in the world. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing that my mother taught me in which I had to realize with a, a lot of hard work that I always have joy. We always have joy. Joy. See, see happiness and uh, happiness is a behavior. Okay. 
joy is permanent. See, when you have joy and you go through a dark time or storm in your life, yes, it is bad, but you can re, you can come back. See, when, when it comes to how we view the world, most of us fall into two categories, optimist mm-hmm. or pessimist, right? And according to most experts, whatever category you fall in has a lot to do with, guess what? Your upbringing. And remember, I described who my mother was, right? Yep. And I described who my father was. And so successful people more aren't all optimists, right? Happy people, they, you know, believe it or not, it's, I know that's like, what? Wait, happy people are not always optimists either, right? But one trait every we all share is the ability to see the opportunity in unlikely places or that glass half full. See, without a dose of optimism, we'll never try anything new. We'll never get up from that storm. And our lives will remain perpetually stuck in the same place. See, forward progress of any kind is is predicated on it. So seeing that glimmer, I was just thinking about my own experience after my mother passed away and my upbringing was all very much enmeshed in classical music. I'm a musician. Oh, I am too. Nice. Well, there you go. We should get (laughs) together. But for five years, I literally could not listen to music at all, let alone play it, because it was wrapped up in too many memories. And so I, I liken it, you know, I was living life, but it was kind of in neutral. And then just after I moved to the States, I remember joining the Broomfield Symphony Orchestra, going to that first rehearsal, literally five years. I'd not, you know, dust off the bassoon. It almost healed over, I think, uh, with lack of use. I know my muscles were not uh, quite up to scratch. But I remember coming home from that rehearsal, bouncing off the walls with I'd rediscovered myself because to your point, the sun had come out, the joy, the happiness, everything was back. Plus, of course, a heavy dose of glass half full and yeah. pragmatic realism of, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to practice again to get back into shape. Yes. But that's it. It's like a, it's, I'm going to call it a roller coaster. Hopefully the steeps aren't too steep for everybody and the climb out isn't too overwhelming. Mm-hmm. But we have to, in my experience, have to have a little bit of both to appreciate. Yeah. The, the joyful moments. Absolutely. You know, Morg, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to have your list as the listeners who are listening to this conversation. I want to prove a point about optimism. I would like you to close your eyes and think about the worst year of your life. What was it? For most people, they will not say 20. Hmm. We, as a nation, have been programmed to think that 2020, 2021 are the worst years of our lives because of the global pandemic. Now, I am not trivializing the seriousness of the global pandemic because it's real and it's going to be with us for Mm -hmm. some time. But what I am saying is, When people close their eyes, and I do this in one of my talks, and when people close their eyes and I say to them, think about the worst year, and I want you to just just yell it out, and you hear it. I did this on a virtual Zoom. 1971, 1988, 1982, 1993, 1999, and so on and so on. One person on a call of 222 people for example, said 2020. Mm -hmm. So one of the exercises in the book, after each chapter are reflection exercises, because I think that's important. That's what I had to do. Everything Mm -hmm. in the book is what I had to do to be here, right? Be back in the joyful Kim that always exists. The Mm -hmm. sun just rose, right? When, for me, when God said, I need you to resurrect who you are. And so what I had to start to do is think about gratitude. 
Ooh. So say more. Tell me about gratitude. So gratitude is the rocket fuel to our resilience. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a, and that's a quote in the book, Optimists Always Win. The reason why I say that is because when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, October 28, 2012, a few short months after my mother passed away, and then my beloved maternal grandmother passed away. When I was told that, I asked the doctor one question. Can you fix it? He said, yes. And I said, in that, in that moment, in the waiting room, I was numb from losing my mother. But I said, Lord, thank you for showing me how to go through this journey because of what my mom showed me. Yeah. That gratitude? That is gratitude. So so tell me a little bit, Kim, there. The inspiration obviously came out of illness. The inspiration for the book is how do you remain resilient and optimistic in the face of challenges? What are leaders and those who might be in a corporate environment who maybe haven't been touched by cancer, what are they going to take from the book? Absolutely. So I, I do want to be clear about something more. The the rocket fuel to writing the book was through illness and life's traumas. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there was going to be a global pandemic, right? But so those practices, those tips, those reflections, exercises, all of what I wrote in the book, yes, was birthed from trauma. But Mm -hmm. now a nation is still facing that. So, and many people are still suffering. So that book is great for them so they so they could read some of the things that helped me. Now from leaders, because I, I am one, I am them, right? I wrote an article, uh, strategies, uh, in, in the American, actually in the American Management Association Journal, um, strategies for leaders um, to lead and virtual in a virtual remade nation, right? Because it's very different. See, leaders, we have to step out outside of our echo chamber, right? And what I mean by that is, see, leader, leadership comes from how you behave, how you act, and how you inherently interact with people. See, this global pandemic, right? And I use this as an example because this is a good test more, that the global pandemic is forcing corporate leaders around the country to draw on their best skills, to become more agile, adaptive leaders. See, also now we're thinking about this renewed attention on diversity, equity, equality, and inclusion, right? In the workplace. And it has been enough to fill any manager's or leader's agenda this year, as we know. But this is now 2021. Diversity is still the highlight of organizations as it should be, right? But the pandemic has really heaped even more pressure on leaders tasked with keeping their employees healthy, right? Mm -hmm. And and safe, while also trying to keep D&I at the top of a growing list of priorities. So, When you ask me what can people take away from this book, leaders specifically, is the level of optimism that's going to skyrocket your resilience. So you talk in the book about 10 discouragement eliminators, and especially now when we're working in a hybrid world where, you know, we're we're limited to the three by five video window, even if, if that is on. Right. What are one or two of those discouragement eliminators that leaders should be paying particular care and attention to right now to help, as you say, re redeposit and grow that optimism in themselves and others? Absolutely. I would say I don't want people to buy the book and skip to the last chapter, <laughs> but there's a cup. There's two chapters. It's talks. I describe your elevator to life's C-suite. So the reason why the byline of the book is Mm -hmm. (laughs) moving from defeat to life C-suite is because 
we all face trouble. We all face issues. We all face a global pandemic. And what leaders can walk away from is understanding the the floors to arriving at their destination of success. And I say that loosely. I say that because leaders, they have to build trust in an organization and value those who've shown them trustworthy behavior. So understanding those floors, if you will, and I'm not going to give away everything, but Mm -hmm. the floors on the way to the C-suite are critical because they are our tried and tested skills that some had to be revitalized. And some of our pot in our positive thinking doesn't mean that we ignore what's going on and what's happening in our workplaces and on our teams. But we have to approach it with optimism and we have to approach it in a most productive way, which is a pivot for many people. Mm-hmm. So that you have to lean on your history. I always talk about the power of your rear view. That's a chapter in the book that I also... That is indeed. It's one of the uh, discouragement eliminators. So come on then, tell tell me about leaning on your rear view. (laughs) So when you look back in your rear view, you're driving in a car, you see history. What I tell leaders and my readers is that you are stronger than you think. We've heard that thousands of times, but you really are. Because if you take a moment to look in the past and look at what you've come from, what you went through, and what you went through and won, that same fortitude, that same grit, that same perseverance, that same level of attitude, of gratitude and optimism needs to happen today. You got to resurrect it. See, we, 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 sometimes it's good to look at the past, right? You just don't dwell there. Yes, and that's, that's part of it. And when we talked earlier about the grief, it's the what are you carrying from the past that it's, about, it's time to put it down. That's not to ignore it or forget about it, but to stop carrying it day to day. Absolutely. Because then that opens up opportunities and possibilities for the future. Yes, optimism is, is a mindset, right, that enables people to view the world other people, and events in its really most favorable and positive light possible. This pandemic accelerated innovation, right, that was already underway at most organizations. And the untimely death of George Floyd and countless others accelerated a company's approach to diversity. So see, you, you see, so, so but, but the theme here is optimism and moving forward. See, many equate optimism with happiness, especially in leadership. Mm -hmm. But one, but while one can breed the other, they're not the same thing. Here's what I mean by that. And while optimists, optimists are usually pegged as the sugar, the sugar Mm -hmm. bearers, because I'm one of those people, right? Unapologetically. But As those who see the positive in every situation, that's not always true either. Because positive thinking, Meg, doesn't mean that you ignore life stressors, right? Or that the pandemic is not here. None of those things. Again, it's just approaching optimism and approaching hardship, I should say, in a different way. See, constructing an optimistic vision of life allows us to have a full interpersonal world in spite of unfortunate circumstances. It reduces our feelings of sadness, depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. It increases our lifespans, right? Fosters stronger relationships with other people. Yep. Right? And provides what? Coping skills that I discuss in the book as eliminators during times of hardship. So that's It's easy to be an optimist when things are going well. And to your point, it's when we get the unexpected COVID curveballs, when we get those setbacks, it's how do you stay in the game? 
How do we lean on the behest, the rear view mirror piece to understand we've navigated this or something similar before? Mm-hmm. So how do I adjust what I learned last time to support this time? But it just keeps us moving forward. I love this, Kimberly. Oh, I'm so happy. And listen, some people are just have been pessimists for most of their lives, right? We know all, everybody knows one, right? But it doesn't mean that they're destined to always be a pessimist. We have to give people grace and be kind. People are going through things that we don't even know about because we Mm -hmm. don't see it. It's internal. So there's many ways to be an optimist. And I will share this one. You've got to take the note of company you keep. And that's leaders. What are your, who are your teams? In life, who are your, fr- who are your friends? Who are your people that sit on your front row of your life? Mm-hmm. We all have those friends, especially right now, who are chronic complainers about what's happening. I don't want to wear a mask. Wear your mask is protecting you from dying. Simple as that. After spending a few hours hearing that, oh, the mask, we have to do this. We are, but you know, I will say this and I love the media because I'm a part of it, but the world made us being at home a bad thing by using one word, lockdown. Mm -hmm. Morg, when you think about lockdown, listeners, when you think about lockdown, it has a negative connotation right? How about I was the most productive and I'm sure many others were during COVID. Why? Because I had time to be at home. I can't tell you how many projects in my home I've done. No <laughs> one this background. This is my office finally completely yeah, organized. Yeah, I'm yeah. with you. It turns out I'm a bit of a homebody. I used to travel every week. Now <laughs> I actually, oh no, I don't yeah. like my own yeah. bed. Lord, I don't miss it. Oh, Lord, listen. I don't miss going to 16 dinners. I don't miss running to five board meetings. I love sitting in the comfort of my own home or my couch or in my office and doing, being just as productive, but just not being in a building. Yes. We have learned so much and leaders have learned so much, not only about how important optimism is and how important, uh, how important our outlook for the future is, but how important and how productive our teams are just being home and being creative. Now, for women, unfortunately, we've read that women are leaving the workforce in high numbers because they now have more roles at Mm -hmm. home. And so, you know, I know that's probably another podcast for another day, but the reason why I bring that up is because When we think about lockdown on top of all of the pivots that we've had to make, negativity is contagious. That that letting lockdown permeate in your mind and to get into your spirit, your outputs will be of a person on lockdown. I can tell an unhappy leader because it is the way that they handle crisis. Yeah. And I like that. It makes me think of a friend and colleague of mine, Anise Kavanagh, who has her IEP um, um, model, Uh which is about intentionality. That's the I. But to your point, the emotion, that's the E. And what is the emotion I'm communicating? And it doesn't mean you ignore the negativity, but be careful how it infects you and others. And that's the P of her model, which is the presence and how we're showing up. So there's a time and a place and a balance to be achieved between, I call it pragmatic optimism that I have right now, the glass half full, but also listening to some extent to the reality check that comes with the glass half empty. And deciding in the moment, which one are you going to listen to? But ultimately, how are you going to choose to move forward versus being a victim and becoming couch locked or whatever it might be? Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about this. In terms of optimists always win, it's the one who chooses, whether it's from the glass half full or the glass half empty perspective, right. to move forward. That's right. That's right. And you know, it's funny because one of the things when, you know, if people want to 
learn a little bit more about each chapter of the book, we have developed um, an engaging YouTube channel mm-hmm. with an exploration into the tools, tactics, and themes from the book, All Optimists Always Win. And so we have the, it's a program, if you will, more of short videos that explore themes from the book, as I mentioned, and will challenge participants to be more optimistic. There is a 21 day of optimism on, on, on the channel that we, there's 21 videos to walk them through each day. It keeps everyone on track and each video is a dose of optimism and practical tips for leveraging the discouragement eliminators. And I consider these to be the most important techniques for successfully adopting a mindset because it has consistency. You okay. are nice. You are deliberate. You have to be intentional because see, people are looking at 2021 as the fifth quarter of 2020. I think so. <laughs> You're right. And I'll make sure that the links to that YouTube channel and the 21 day optimism challenge are in the show notes here. How else, as we come to the end of our time together, Kim, how else can others learn about you, the work that you're doing about diversity and inclusion, but also more about the optimists always win? Sure. So I'm Kimberly Reed, and thank you so much, Morg, for having me. This was such a delightful conversation. You are just simply amazing. Please keep inspiring us all to be better. And you do that. You absolutely do that. Um, I can be found at a couple of places um, on LinkedIn, Kimberly mm-hmm. S. Reed. I'm very simple. My All my social media handles are Kimberly S. Reed, Twitter, Instagram, all of them. Um, also, the redevelopmentgroup.com. And actually, we are taking some of this summer. It's still up and running and you can still visit, but we are revitalizing it. So after September 7th, it will look very different. Um, mm-hmm. And also, optimists always win. Every book that we sell is going to bless others because we are donating 100% of the proceeds to two cancer charities and one right both in Philadelphia, but one specifically the American Cancer Society, the Philadelphia Hope Lodge, where families go who have a loved one that is being treated or going into hospice um, that has long-term care because we know that hotels are astronomical and most families cannot afford that when they are here for months at a time in Philadelphia. Um, And so they need our help. And my hope is that this book not only blesses others, gives leaders tools, but it also makes a difference and an impact in the world that we know now as the Remade Nation. Well, Kimberly, thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Wish you ongoing success and Maybe in the fifth quarter of 2020, we'll get to meet in three dimensions. Who knows? <laughs> oh, so. That will be wonderful. And I can't wait to get you your book that will be signed and by me with a special message to thank you once again for having me, more, And thank your listeners for listening and, and, and hearing my thoughts about life. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.